Okay, so we're going to finish up talking about the nervous system here, and we're going to discuss the different cell gates uh, or ion channels that are present within the nervous system. So we have the uh, sodium channels, we have the, the calcium channels, uh, potassium channels, um, and they're ligand gated and voltage gated. So depending on which ones are activated, it's going to determine whether uh, we are going through a depolarization, repolarization, hyperpolarization, um, or if we're going to hit threshold or not. So when we're looking at these channels, uh, this is going to be the, uh, these are going to be the key players with the action potential. The uh, sodium gated, uh, voltage gated channels and the uh, voltage gated potassium channels. So when we talked about the action potential, you can see on this picture where you're going to have sodium permeability, potassium permeability in that green, uh, sodium is in the yellow, um, and, and then what the action potential is doing is in that faded pink right here. So during the resting state, you have both of these channels that are closed. Okay, This inactivation gate, which is going to be the mechanical barrier, is, is going to just be sitting there. It's not closing or, or opening anything at the moment. Okay. So when we have uh, this um, action potential beginning, what we do is we get to that threshold of that negative 55. So you, if you get to that all or nothing phase, you're going to get to uh, open that sodium channel. Okay, and that's what causes depolarization. So depolarization is is taking the the poles and bringing them closer together. So you're making it less negative, bringing it closer to even between the inside and outside of the cell. So essentially what we're looking at doing is uh, taking sodium, letting it rush into the cell so that your inside of the cell is creating a more positive environment or in our case here, less negative. So it goes from negative 55 to the zero and then even reaches a little bit beyond that to that positive 30, okay? So that will happen and create that spike. And it's a very quick spike because sodium really, really wants to get into the cell because one, sodium is in very high concentrations outside of the cell and very low concentrations inside the cell. So it has two really good reasons to want to get into the cell. Um, at that time, potassium channels are still closed. So potassium is sitting in there and that contributes to that really positive environment. Once you get to that peak of the action potential, well then your inactivation gate of the sodium channel close, so you actually have this mechanical barrier that now prevents sodium from getting in. The gate itself isn't closed, but this inactivation gate will stop any sodium from getting in until it, it repolarizes the cell. Meanwhile, the potassium channels are now open. Now potassium has two really good reasons to get out of the cell. Because now the internal environment is very positive because all the sodium that rushed in and it's in a high concentration inside the cell, low concentration of potassium outside of the cell. So multiple reasons for potassium to want to leave, which actually repolarizes the cell. So now you go from a very from a slightly positive environment to a negative, very negative environment in fact. Uh, it overshoots the resting membrane resting membrane potential, and instead of it being at negative uh, 70 uh, millivolts, it actually will reach uh, as high as negative 90 or negative 100 millivolts, um, so that it makes it more difficult to uh, excite another action potential because it's farther away from that threshold. Okay, So hyperpolarization is um, because that, that sodium channel continues to um, stay open, whereas the sodium channel now, instead of having that inactivation gate, um, after you, you go past that threshold, the, in, in, the inactivation gate will now swing open, but the voltage gate will now close because it is now below that threshold to open that voltage-gated sodium channel. So anything um, below the negative 55 is going to close the voltage-gated channels, but the inactivation gate will now be open. So at this point, in repolarization, you cannot go through another action potential because the uh, sodium uh, gated channel is closed with the, that inactivation gate. 
but once you get past the threshold, well, that inactivation gate is now open, so now you just need to get back to that negative 55 to create another action potential and open up that sodium channel. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So the difference here is sodium channels are, are going to open when you get to that negative 55, okay? at least through uh, the voltage gated, and then it's going to close when it gets to that positive 30, and the potassium channel will then open. So the inactivation gate is, uh, is closing that gate at positive 30 until you get back below threshold. Okay, so that's the mechanical blocking of that channel. Now potassium is going to open at that same point, creating that repolarization. Okay, and then once you get past the negative 55, this ligand gated or inactivation gate is going to open so that now you can potentially create new action potential. Okay, so what is depolarization of the neuron? Okay, so it's not an increased negativity of the neuron, so we automatically can rule out C and D. In fact, it would be a reduction in that membrane potential. So you're taking the potential and actually creating energy from it. So when you utilize the potential, the potential is no longer there. It's like taking that rock on the top of the hill. Well, once you start to push that rock and it rolls down, well, you lose potential the farther it goes down the hill because it's actually taking that potential and turning it into active, used energy. So this, the, the action potential as we're going through the cell is going to propagate. Okay, So propagate means it creates a wave. So you go from one end of the neuron, of the axon, to the other end. So it's changing the polarity of the cell um, uh, in a wave pattern, so it's as if water was flowing through this tube, through this lumen, okay? So it creates this positive environment inside and negative environment outside, and it slowly moves, uh, well, I shouldn't say slowly, it very quickly moves down the axon. So what you can see here is that there's only a slight area that is positive inside and negative outside. The rest of the axon is going to be negative inside and positive outside, so it creates this short burst of change in the voltage of the neuron, okay? So voltage is at negative 70, okay? And once you get to uh, propagate, so they actually measured uh, the neuron polarity in midway through the, the neuron. And so you can see um, as, uh, uh, as it begins, you're not reading any change in, um, in the polarity or the voltage um, at the electrode, okay? But as the wave passes through the axon, you actually get a reading here for a brief period of time. And that's how they created this, this wave picture of the uh, action potential, okay? So at time zero, well, the action potential has not yet reached that electrode. It's going through the axon, but it hasn't reached the, the, uh, the electrode where you actually will measure the, um, the voltage. At two milliseconds, the action potential peak is at the electrode. So that is where you actually have changed the, um, the voltage at the point that the electrode is at, okay? But at four milliseconds, well, now the action potential is far beyond the electrode, and so the electrode won't read it anymore, okay? In fact, it reads a, a spike in the, uh, the depolarization and then a quick drop that actually goes to more of a, a negative right here in that, that gray zone, and then it reaches the rest of the membrane potential right here where you have that yellow zone. So that's where what you, what you have is the, the different colors. The yellow is the resting membrane potential, so that's the negative 70 millivolts. The red is gonna be the peak, so that's when you spike the, um, the polarity to make it uh, that positive 30, because it's gonna go really, really fast. So it's a very small section. And the hyperpolarization is going to be that gray zone. And you can see the gray zone is much long, uh, larger um, than the red zone. The red zone is very quick, very short. Um, and so you can create this action potential and after a couple of milliseconds to reestablish that gradient, you can actually create another action potential that follows. Okay. And we 
touched on this a couple slides ago with absolute versus relative refractory. Refractory means that you're, uh, you're not able to create another action potential. So you have a period of rest um, where uh, you build up the stores of those ions to create that rest and membrane potential. You, you have to have potential in order to create this energy. So um, when you are going through the action potential, you, you can't create another one because you're currently in the middle of that. It's like taking your uh, taking a glass and bringing it up to your lips. Well, you can't bring that cup up to your lips when you already have the cup up to your lips. Okay, you have to bring that arm back down before you can stimulate another contraction of the muscle. So you can't do it when it's already occurring, essentially. So the absolute refractory period is the spike up and down. So anything above threshold means that you cannot create another action potential because you're currently in the middle of an action potential. So you spike and you go back down and you can create another one only after you get back down past threshold. So if we look at this and here is threshold, well, in, uh, you cannot get the, um, uh, the action potential when you're above that line. So let's even go back a couple more slides. Okay, so threshold is here. So this would be an absolute refractory period. So anything above that line, you cannot stimulate another action potential. As soon as you get past the threshold, you can create another action potential. So you do not have to go all the way back down and up here. You have to go all the way back down past threshold in order to create another action potential. Okay. So relative refractory period means that it's going to be more difficult to create an action potential. It's possible, but it's not, uh, it's not easy to do. So you have to have a very strong stimulus in order to create another action potential during that relative refractory period, which is as soon as you get past uh, the, uh, the threshold line. Okay. So the velocity of the impulse depends on the diameter of the, the neuron. So the larger the diameter of the, the neuron, the less resistance. The less resistance, the faster that velocity can travel. Okay? And it also depends on the degree of myelination. Okay? So myelin is again an insulator which allows you to skip different parts of the, um, of the neuron. Okay? So you go from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier to another node of Ranvier until you reach the axon terminal. And the node of Ranvier is, um, is going to be the gap between the myelin sections. So they are unmyelinated brief periods or brief sections of the neuron. Okay, so you skip those sections, which is known as a saltatory conduction. So yes, you need to know saltatory conduction. That's likely going to show up on some exam. You need to know about the nodes of Ranvier and that myelin is an insulator, but it allows you to skip. Okay, so yes, insulation typically will slow down that nerve impulse, um, but in the case of myelin, it allows you to skip parts, uh, great segments of the neuron itself. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of things here. In an organism, action potentials are propagated unidirectionally toward the axon ending because of what? Well, it's because membranes become non-responsive due to inactive sodium channels after action potential generation. So you cannot open uh, sodium channels that are already open. Okay, They're already there. They're going through that action potential. And then once you get to that peak, you cannot uh, close them or you cannot open them again because you have that inactivation gate, which is that mechanical barrier. Okay, So in the case of... Uh, of going unidirectionally, this is important. You only want to go in one direction with that action potential so that it goes to its destination. You don't want the action potential going back and forth and sending in a signal from the dendrites to the, uh, to the axon terminal. So that's, that's something that we try to close off. The point at which the all or nothing, nothing principle of the action potential generation is reached is termed what? Well, in this case, it's, it's termed the threshold. So that is the, the um, dotted line that we've been talking about. 
if you reach threshold, it's it's going to either go it's going to go through that action potential. If you don't reach threshold, you don't go through a, an action potential. Um, you just will repolarize the cell so that you have that potential ready to reach threshold to create a signal. So you have to have a strong enough stimulus in order to create an action potential. Okay. So the chem chemical synapse. Well, we touched on this in the muscle unit because the uh, neuromuscular junction is a, a, is a chem chemical synapse where you have the axon terminal, the synaptic plaque, and that receptor region, which in the neuromuscular junction is the muscle cell. Um, in, if, in neurons, you can have muscles, you can have uh, glands, or you can have another neuron that you're sending a signal to. So the axon terminal is going to be the ending of the axon, the termination of the axon that will release a neurotransmitter from the neuron across that synaptic cleft, which is the space between the neuron and its receptor region. Okay, So again, the receptor region can be a muscle, can be a gland, or it can be another neuron. It's something that you're communicating information with. Okay. So the axon terminal is going to need calcium to open up or to bind the neurotransmitter synap uh, secretory vesicles to the synaptic cleft where those neurotransmitters will cross and bind to a ligand gated receptor on the receptor. Okay, And so in the case of the neuromuscular junction, that neurotransmitter was acetylcholine. The axon terminal is going to be the neuron, the somatic neuron, in the uh, motor uh, division of the peripheral nervous system. So again, you, you want to be able to separate and classify these neurons. Um, as we talked about at the very beginning of the lecture, it's going to cross that cleft and it's going to bind with the, the ligand gated channel, opening up sodium to depolarize the cell, or it can bind to a channel that hyperpolarizes the cell, as is the case with, uh, with dopamine, which will shut down muscle contraction. Okay, So the transfer of information across the synapse is going to occur in six steps. Okay. And we touched again, we touched on this when we discussed the neuromuscular junction, so a lot of this should be reviewed. Okay. But you get this axon that comes down towards the receptor field and you have this synap uh, the synaptic cleft with the axon terminal and the receptor region down here. So you have this action potential propagation, that wave of the uh, voltage that's going to come down the axon. And when you get to the end, it opens these voltage-gated calcium channels. So voltage-gated means that you have to have a, uh, a change in the voltage to open up those channels. And in this case, you have to have the, um, the depolarization of the cell membrane that will open up these calcium channels. When they open up, those calcium channels will bind those secretory vesicles to the axon terminal cell membrane, okay, which will release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Well, you have this space, but it is uh, well-defined so that you will only be able to get the uh, neurotransmitter to that specific receptor. Okay, so voltage-gated calcium channels open, calcium enters the axon, calcium uh, causes uh, neurotransmitter-containing synaptic vesicles to release their contents by exocytosis, so the secretory vesicle binds to the cell membrane and it will open up those channels so that now the neurotransmitter crosses the synaptic cleft, binds to those ligand-gated channels. Okay, it's ligand-gated because you have to have a ligand or a a chemical a neurotransmitter that binds to the receptor, okay, so you have that lock and key here, okay, uh, binds to the receptor on the postsynaptic membrane, and the neurotransmitter opens up ion channels, resulting in a graded potential. And a graded potential is either a positive or negative. It either brings your, your cell here, which is a neuron, a muscle, or a gland, it either brings it closer to or farther away from threshold. So just because you get a signal from the neuron does not mean that you're going to get another uh, action potential from this neuron over. 
there are some neurons that will actually shut down or make it more difficult to create that stimulus. Okay, um, I can think of a few examples, one of which would be a, uh, a, a gate receptor. Um, so there are um, pain receptors in your body that will send uh, pain from your arm uh, or from your body to your central nervous system. Now, actual uh, touch on that region is going to activate a neuron that will shut down that signal. So it will activate a neuron that goes to the, uh, uh, to the spinal cord that will uh, interact with an inner neuron and it will create a, a dopamine or a serotonin response that shuts down the signal of the nociceptors, which are your pain receptive neurons, uh, from firing and creating that uh, cortical or conscious awareness of pain. So you can either create a, an action potential or shut down an action potential. It's essentially what we're talking about. So the neurotransmitter effects are terminated by reuptake through transport proteins, enzymatic degradation, or diffusion away from the synapse. So you can take this neurotransmitter and uh, it can either be broken down, you can take it back into the neuron for use um, later on, Okay, when you have another action potential, or it can diffuse away from the synapse. So most neurons, uh, they will have either a reuptake or a breakdown in that um, specific um, region so that you cannot um, take that neurotransmitter and activate the, the neuron over and over and over again. Uh, one example is with reuptake inhibitors, you can have SSRI, which is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors because the neurons that have that release serotonin are going to um, are going to take that serotonin back into the neuron until that neuron stimulates the release of serotonin again. If you block the reuptake inhibitors, serotonin will stay in the synaptic cleft and continue to um, to bring that um, uh, to to cause that greater potential. So those serotonin um, uh, neurotransmitters will stay bound to the chemical or ligand-gated channels to create that graded potential. So here's a good case study. And you can find these in your book. And I, I would encourage you to, uh, to take some time and go through these case studies. Um, see if you understand what they mean. Okay, so I would read through this and uh, and if you have to pause uh, the lecture to read through this and, and go through the questions, I really encourage that you take 15 minutes and go through uh, the case study here. Okay, a couple of things that you're going to need to know. Valium enhances in inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Those are graded potentials. Okay, So inhibitory would shut down that, um, the, the cells or the neurons' ability to create a new action potential. So it takes it, it takes that uh, action or the uh, resting membrane potential, and it brings it farther away from threshold. Excitatory postsynaptic potentials, or EPSPs, are going to be bringing the neuron closer to that threshold, or closer to creation of a new action potential. Okay, so that would be something that you you want to do, uh, want to know. Okay. So go through this. The answers are in the book. Um, I, I can give you the answers, but it's going to be just as valuable, if not more so, to look up the answers in the book and to search for the answers as you're going through the notes. You learn a lot by going through uh, these and, and, and actually failing a little bit. Put down the answer that you think makes the most sense. Okay. Uh, go through that process of trying to come up with your own answer and then look up the answer um, later on because it's going to stick with you a lot better than just looking up the answer. You're going to forget that. If I just tell you the answer, again, it's just going to fade right away. Um, you're not going to remember how you got to the answer. You're not going to remember the, the thought process. And when we get to how you create long-term and short-term memories, this will make a lot more sense. And this is also something we can go over in class. So I would write down your answers, look them up in the book, and then we can discuss this in person if you have questions. 
So what is the location in which a neuron interacts with its target cell? This would be the synapse. Okay. The other ones don't make sense. In fact, the axial axonic target is completely made up. <coughs> Does depolarization always lead to an action potential? Okay, well I hope you weren't just playing on your phone. I know sometimes that happens in lecture, um, but since you're watching this at home, uh, the answer is, sorry, the answer is no. Because graded potentials are depolarization or hyperpolarization. Okay. All or nothing is the case with an action potential, but you have to get to threshold in order to create that all or nothing. So a graded depolarization does not necessarily create uh, an action potential. You have to have enough depolarization to bring it from its resting membrane potential to threshold to allow you to propagate that action potential along the, uh, the axon. So at what level is threshold? So what, where do you have to get to in order to create this action potential? So this is really important to know that it is uh, negative 55. Negative 55 is threshold. Negative 70 is typically where you're going to have that resting membrane potential. Negative 20 is only going to be hit when you're going through the action potential. Negative 20 is a really high um, a depolarization or a hyperpolarization. So typically we won't, we won't see this unless you're really trying to avoid any sort of um, stimulation. Neurotransmitters are important in functioning of what type of synapse. So what is a neurotransmitter? Okay. Is it an electrical signal? No, it's not. It's a chemical signal. Okay. So you're, uh, you're, you're creating this binding or this ligand-gated channel opening uh, with the neurotransmitter. Okay. So this is a chemical synapse. And electrical would be the voltage. Gap is the, the synapse itself. Um, and conversion just doesn't make sense. So there's a few terms here that you're going to want to understand. Neuropathy is becoming a, a very hot topic. Um, it's a damage to the neurons. Okay, So uh, apathy would be some sort of pathology of the nervous system. So peripheral neuropathy is becoming kind of a big issue um, in a lot of clinics. Now, a lot of different things can cause neuropathy, but the most common ones are going to be uh, alcoholics, uh, diabetics, and people who have gone through chemotherapy can suffer from neuropathy. Typically, we'll start in either the hands or the feet, so the distal extremities, and it will cause uh, numbness, tingling, loss of feeling, um, and then some people, uh, some sharp pains that uh, don't shut off uh, very well. So diabetics and alcoholics, um, uh, they do significant damage to them, their bodies over the course of time where they are going to actually damage the neurons and destroy them. Um, they don't heal very well and they don't have very good receptive regions. And it usually works from the distal ends back. Um, the diabetics is a lot because um, they have very poor circulation, so their hands and their feet uh, tend to get very cold when it is cold out. Um, and they also will do damage to those neurons. So there are some promising therapies. Uh, there are, um, I've worked in neuropathy clinics where they work with electric muscle stem at a high level with um, some numbing agents that will uh, allow you to create more of a signal in those extremities. I've also seen a lot of very good uh, work done with cold laser therapy so class four cold lasers are being utilized to stimulate uh, the nerve regeneration. Well, you cannot create new neurons, but you, if you stimulate a healing potential within those nerves, uh, you can actually regenerate the ends, the receptive regions, or even the, um, the axons if they are damaged. So you can regenerate neurons if they are damaged. Um, and, and you can even talk to people who have had things like um, MS who might have had nerve ablations. Those nerve ablations are designed to, to burn the nerve endings 
um, so that uh, people who have chronic pain don't feel pain in that region anymore. But a lot of these individuals will have those nerve ablations, be out of pain for a couple of weeks, and then the pain will come back because those neurons will regenerate the, the receptive fields. So some of the best things that I've seen for neuropathy, well, chiropractic adjustments, because now you clear up the interference of the nervous system. So you have that flow that allows the neuron to heal itself um, and uh, correction of the underlying disease. So if you have a diabetic, well, you need to address the diabetes. So they better be eating a very uh, proper uh, meal and a proper diet. Otherwise, they're going to continue to damage their neurons. So diabetics really need to be focused on cutting out sugar from their diets. So they should be eating fruits and vegetables and drinking water. Um, soda, even diet soda, in fact, diet soda may even be um, a, a cause of, of diabetes and cancer. Um, so anything sugary or sweet can, can uh, be a, a, a problem with uh, neuropathy. Uh, and alcoholics need to cut out alcohol. Um, if you're undergoing chemotherapy, well, that's just going to kill uh, your, the cells of your body. Um, so under, uh, in the middle of chemotherapy, you just have to manage uh, those patients. And speaking of things like aspartame and sucralose, uh, neurotoxins. Okay, so neurotoxins are any sort of chemical ion that is found uh, or ingested in the body that will affect or damage the neurons. So some of the worst neurotoxins would be things like mercury, aluminum, uh, fluoride is a, is a potent neurotoxin. Okay, there's there's several others, uh, aspartame and sucralose, as we were talking about, MSG. All of those can damage the neurons, and, uh, and leads, things like that. Um, those can stay in the brain. Uh, they can stay if they cross a blood-brain barrier, or they can stay in the body and continue to damage. The, the neurons. So some of the, the, like I said, some of the worst are going to be those metals. Um, um, once mercury and, and aluminum get into the system, they do not leave um, very effectively. Okay. Uh, neuropharmacology is going to be the treatment of, uh, of nervous system diseases using medications. So it's synthetic drugs, um, essentially. Um, so this could be your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are going to block the reuptake of serotonin so that uh, serotonin is kept in that synaptic uh, cleft and continues to do uh, the same continues to do the same uh, type of, uh, of of work that the neurotransmitter is supposed to do. So neuropharmacology is just any sort of uh, of change in the function of the nervous system based on the drugs that we put into our bodies. Okay, you can have either agonist or antagonist within the synaptic cleft. So an agonist is going to be any chemical that mimics the same uh, effect that a neurotransmitter would. So acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter from the muscle into the um, into the synaptic cleft to stimulate contraction of the muscles. Well, nicotine will actually act as, a, as the same way that acetylcholine would. So it mimics the effects, hence the name nicotinic receptors, which is what we talk about for receptors that bind acetylcholine that create a depolarization effect. So nicotine is going to uh, mimic that. And where is nicotine found? It's found in cigarettes. It's found in tobacco. Okay, so that can create some of those uh, those tremors. Uh, antagonists are going to actually shut down, so they're going to do the exact opposite effect. So tetrodotoxin and botulinum are going to shut down the uh, acetylcholine uh, receptors. So uh, tetrodotoxin, which is found in pufferfish, and botulinum, which is Botox, are going to actually cause a, a lack of muscle function. So when you get a Botox injection, you're unable to contract your muscles. So you're actually getting, um, uh, you're decreasing those wrinkles because your muscles are not firing, they're not contracting, they're not creating that that uh, that wrinkle. And tetrodotoxin can be extremely, um, extremely harmful in high quantities 
Uh, if you have too much of it, it actually will kill you. Same with Botox. Um, so botulinum can be very, uh, very problematic if it is not injected properly. Um, and so they're using that for, uh, for getting rid of wrinkles, but also there is some, uh, some work being done to get rid of headaches with Botox. Though, though that would be one of the, the last things I would try um, because headaches respond very well to changes in diet. It, they respond extremely well to chiropractic care, um, to stress management. Um, and then uh, it, it, again, it's, it's getting rid of things that are neurotoxic, such as aspartame, sucralose, MSG, and any sort of uh, heavy metals. So that is going to be the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, we'll run through more of this on uh, Thursday in our next lecture. Uh, this is this should give you a nice overview. You're going to really want to to understand the division the divisions of the nervous system. So know how to put um, neurons into the categories. I would write this pattern down, one that we had at the very beginning of the lecture, um, over and over and over again to classify them based on their function and then also on their structure as well. The membrane potential, that's something that we can discuss more in, in person as well, but um, if you watch the lecture a couple of times to go through the information that we talked about, uh, that's going to give you a good idea. Write out, draw out the action potentials. Know when sodium channels are open, know when potassium channels are open, know when they close, know the threshold lines, the resting membrane potential, how you create that, that curve and that, uh, that arch. Okay? No propagation of the neuron. And, uh, and, and you should be okay. This is the, basic, the basis for what we're going to be talking about as we go through uh, the rest of the term. So we're going to be discussing the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. There's so much fun uh, once we get to them and your body is absolutely incredible in what it can do. So if you have any questions, let me know. You have a unit exam next week. That'll be a take-home exam. Uh, the, uh, the quiz uh, are due and then uh, remember to do homework too. Don't worry about critical thinking. Those, uh, those are um, ain't found in the book. I would do them if you have time and want to learn more and test yourself it's a great way to test yourself